Hey everyone, Alvin here. Today I'll be flying on Japan Airlines in their 777 Skyspeed Business Class from Los Angeles to Tokyo. After sitting through a lot of traffic to get into LAX, we arrived at a very busy Tom Bradley International Terminal at 10 30 in the morning. Making our way to the Japan Airlines check in area, we were relieved to find no queues at the priority check in lanes. After getting checked in and dropping off our bags, our TSA pre check got us through security within 5 to 10 minutes. With a lot of time to spare before boarding, we took some time to explore the terminal, but mostly to check out some of the other aircraft at the gates. After a healthy dose of plane spotting, we headed to the One World Business Class Lounge, located on mezzanine level 5, beside the LAX Time Tower. As the name implies, the One World Lounge welcomes priority passengers on all the One World airlines, such as Qantas, British Airways, Cathay Pacific, and of course, JAL. The lounge was spacious and provided an ample amount of seating options. Due to the location of the lounge, there wasn't much of a view, and as such, not much natural light coming in through the limited windows. When we got there, the lounge staff were in the process of transitioning the buffet spread from breakfast to lunch service, so the existing food spread didn't look too appetizing. Fortunately, they did bring out some decent salads, so I got myself a plate along with some tortilla chips with salsa. I was saving my appetite for the Japanese meal on board later, anyways, so I didn't want to be too full. Showers are available at this lounge too, should you wish to use them. About 30 minutes before our scheduled boarding, we headed to our gate 157, where our aircraft was loading up. For this flight, we'll be flying on Japan Airlines 777 300ER, Juliet Alpha 739 Juliet. Before we board the flight, let me take a moment to introduce this video's sponsor, Sterling Pacific. Whether you're a pilot, a frequent flyer, or just someone who loves to travel, you'll know that having a high quality, reliable, and maneuverable luggage can go a long way to make your journey a pleasant one. For years, I've been traveling with a family of Remoa luggages, ranging from the Salsa line to the Topaz Stealth cabin, as well as the original Check in Twist, and fell in love with all of them. So when Sterling Pacific asked if I wanted to try out their full aluminum cases, I was naturally very curious. Sterling Pacific is a spec driven premium luggage brand that released their first set of full aluminum travel cases in 2021, and since then they've received a lot of attention from pilots and frequent flyers. Their cases are made of 50 52 aluminum reinforced with A380 aluminum corners, both of which are used in aerospace manufacturing due to their high strength to weight ratio and high corrosion resistance. Impact bearing ridges line the front and back of the case, giving it a sleek industrial look. Accented by the full grain Italian leather handles. While other manufacturers use cheaper plastic components for the trolley handle, trolley housing, and wheel housing, Sterling Pacific uses aluminum for all of it, making it a truly full aluminum product. Sterling Pacific intentionally went with two oversized wheels instead of four, claiming that this design offers maximum control and works better with rough or uneven terrain. They sent me their 35 liter cabin travel case for me to use and review. While I haven't had the chance to take it on an actual trip yet, I'll offer a few first impressions. First of all, this luggage looks stunning, almost like an art piece, even. 
It has a very high quality build and feels ultra premium the moment you get your hands on it. The case looks really classy on the inside as well, with the brown lining that matches the leather handles. The two-wheel design might not be suitable for everyone, but it does have certain advantages such as having an easier time going over rough surfaces like cobblestone streets and elevator gaps. I can't wait to try it out on my next trip. If you're considering a premium luggage to elevate your travels, check out Sterling Pacific's line of aluminum travel cases using the link sterlingpacific.com slash one more and use the code one more for $300 off your purchase. It's definitely not the most affordable option out there, but it does offer something unique for those who aren't willing to compromise on their luggage. Continuing on with our trip, it is now time to board. Japan Airlines uses Apex Suites for their 777 business class cabin, which they call Sky Suites. For this flight, I had booked seat 10A, a window seat, while Peterson booked 10C right beside me in an aisle seat. While the cabin is configured in a 232 layout, each seat still has direct aisle access. When we boarded the flight, all the windows were shut and the mood lighting was on, giving it a very soothing ambiance, as well as helping the plane maintain a comfortable temperature. Waiting on the seat was a JAL amenity pouch, a pair of noise cancelling headphones, slippers, the menu, as well as a blanket. One of the highlights of Jao Sky Suite is the huge amount of legroom you get, even when lying fully flat. For my window seat, I have a little aisle to get in and out of my seat. If you're traveling with a companion, it's best to book two seats beside each other like this, as you can keep the barrier lowered and be able to see and talk to each other, while still having your own space. There are some differences with the aisle seat, most notably the extra storage cubby beside the seat, as well as a mesh pouch for personal items. While I praise the seat for the extensive leg room, the functional storage space is a little lacking. The pre-departure beverage was a cold-pressed juice, a very refreshing mix of apple, pineapple, lemon, and ginger. From C10A, you get a great view of the engine. The tray table is stored under a flap on this ledge. To deploy it, push down on it, pull up and swing out. The table is quite sturdy when deployed. You can move the table forward and backward, as well as swing it sideways, giving you enough room to squeeze out to use the lavatories in the middle of meal service. The seat controls can be found in front of the armrests. It's showing its age a bit, but it's still functional and easy to use. The IFE controller can be found here. We'll talk about how bad it is to use later. At the front of the seat was a universal power outlet as well as a USB port. Near the side of the seat is the headphone jack, and higher up you'll find the reading lamp. The literature pocket can be found in front beside the TV. There is also a small coat hook on the other side of the TV. The privacy barrier can be raised after takeoff by pressing on a button among the seat controls. The headrest can be folded in for support while sleeping. On this plane, there are no adjustable air nozzles overhead. I noticed that most people are not interested to look outside at all. I'm the only one with the window shades up. Here are the JAL slippers provided. They're quite soft and comfortable and very handy for those toilet breaks.
Soon enough, it was time for pushback. Enjoy the beautiful sound of the GE90 starting up. It's still one of my favorite engine sounds to date. Even though our flight was parked at Tom Bradley's South Concourse, we were instructed to depart off the northern 24 left runway. So it was a long taxi, which I didn't mind at all. After takeoff, I tried to use the IFE. However, since you sit so far from the TV, you have to use the IFE controller, which in this case was barely usable. The system was slow, laggy with frequent stutters and freezes, making scrolling through the entertainment selection incredibly difficult. The UI was also poor and outdated. I don't know if it was just my seat, but Peterson seemed to have a similar experience as well. Definitely the most underwhelming part of this business class product. Given the state of the IFE controller, I wasn't surprised to see the old, non-interactive flight map either. Today's flight to Japan will take just over 11 hours, flying straight across the Pacific Ocean. As we reached cruising altitude, the crew began to prep for meal service, they handed out a package for the wet towel as well as a cleansing wipe. Here are the noise cancelling headphones provided by JAL. Initially they felt comfortable to wear, but I noticed after just an hour of wearing it while watching a movie, my ears began to hurt a bit. The amenity kit provided by JAL is from Maison Kitsuni. The contents are a little light. You get a dental kit, moisture mask, pocket tissue, eye mask, and earplugs. However, the inside of the pouch is quite nice, with some designs including Mount Fuji.
now that we have taken off, the privacy barriers can be raised. However, since I was flying with Peterson, I kept it lowered for the entire flight. As we're about to begin the meal service, let's take a look at the menu. The meal started off with some nuts and olives. I was surprised to see olives on a Japanese carrier. I usually only see that on European airlines. For my drink, I tried out the Skytime peach and grape mix, which was quite nice. Of course, I opted for the Japanese menu, so for my appetizer, I got this pretty looking box containing seasonal delicacies. The box came with grilled chicken and seasonal vegetables in vinegar sauce, steamed egg custard with salmon roe, mushrooms with tofu sauce, spinach in Japanese dashi broth, and eggplant with miso sauce and simmered prawn. Peterson also got the Japanese meal, so I'm not sure why he was so curiously looking over at my box. Everything was mostly pretty good, especially the steamed egg custard with ikura. However, the chicken was a bit of a letdown, as you can tell by Peterson's expression here. After being disappointed by the chicken, I had some reservations about the main course, which consisted of a grilled red snapper, braised beef short ribs, pickled vegetables, miso soup, and steamed rice. The fish was actually quite nice, but the beef was mediocre. As for the pickled vegetables, miso soup, and steamed rice, you can't really go wrong there. To wrap up the meal, I had a mango panna cotta for dessert, which was delicious. After the meal, the crew mentioned to me that I could order the anytime snacks through the IFE controller, which I appreciated, but knowing how difficult the controller was to use, I figured I'd just call the crew over instead. Wi-Fi is available on this flight. You can purchase a 1 hour plan for 1015, a 3 hour plan for 1440, or the entire flight for 1880. The crew soon dimmed the lights for passengers to get some rest. I started watching a movie, but pretty soon fell sleepy myself, so decided to take a nap. But before that, let's visit the lavatory. First of all, I really like the dark color walls. Gives it a bit of an upscale feel. It was also quite well stocked with mouthwash, toothbrush set, lotion, and face mist. The amenities are provided by Miller Harris. The size of the lavatory was pretty standard, and you also get a full length mirror behind as well. Once I got back to my seat, I set up my bed to get some sleep. As mentioned, one of the best parts about these Apex seats is the amount of legroom you get. JAL also provides this mattress pad, which was really soft and comfortable. The blanket, however, was quite staticky. I ended up sleeping for two hours, and when I woke up, we were making good progress across the Pacific. The cabin also got a bit too warm for my liking. I decided to try the crew's suggestion to order some snacks from the IFE controller to see if it would actually work. And after a few minutes of struggling with the controller, I did manage to order something. I ended up ordering Jal's special healthy ramen noodle. The soup was thick and rich, which I really enjoyed. I also asked the crew for the drink they served during pre-departure, which is actually not listed on the menu. 
Peterson ordered the starchy sauce rice bowl consisting of mushroom, shrimp, and squid, which he said was good as well. You could also grab some snacks and water from the galley if you wish. I don't know why I bothered with the IV controller, but I ended up using it again to order myself an ice cream and a coffee. About two and a half hours before arrival into Tokyo, I asked for the arrival set meal which was very enjoyable. It consisted of yuzu flavored grilled salmon, braised hijiki seaweed, steamed rice and miso soup. I noticed that Jiao does their fish really well. For my drink, I just got a cranberry juice. Our arrival into Japan coincided quite nicely with the sunset, so enjoy the scenic approach into Tokyo.
overall, I had a really great experience. The amount of legroom and privacy you get in Zhao's Sky Suite is quite hard to beat. The timing of the flight was pretty relaxing too. You don't need to wake up too early for the flight, and you get into Japan just in time for a late dinner. Aside from a few hiccups, the food was mostly delicious. Of course, you can always expect amazing hospitality from Jal Crew. A few negatives. The design of the seat, while awarding you with fantastic leg room, makes a trade off for some limited storage areas. There's no side table like many other airlines, just a little ledge which barely fit the width of my phone. I found it difficult throughout the flight to put my personal items and had to resort to using the tray table most of the time. The IV was also hugely disappointing. It was sluggish and glitchy, and just not up to standard at all. It definitely needs revamp. And with that, it's a wrap for another trip report. Hope you enjoyed coming along on this flight to Japan. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, it would mean a lot if you could hit the like button and consider supporting me by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching, happy travels, and I'll see you in the next one.